Our arrows will block out the sun. That was the message that Xerxes sent to Leonidas in 480 BC before the Battle of Thermopylae. As the fighting commenced, 5,000 Persian archers fired their arrows in an arc into the Greek lines. And as it turns out, falling arrows aren't that effective against armor. So they invented this and shot it like this. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Greyhawk English Longbow Replica. Today we're going to be looking at the bow itself, everything from its dimensions to its usability and accuracy and construction. We're also going to be diving into the history of the English Longbow and bows more generally, including their use, construction, and effectiveness in battle. But before we get to that, remember to like, comment, and subscribe, and hit the notification bell for more content. So let's look at the Greyhawk here. This particular bow was bought from Three Rivers Archery. I don't remember what we bought this for, but as of me making this video, it currently sells for $250 on Three Rivers. For context, that's on the low end for English longbow replicas. This bow is 72 inches long and comes with a 68 inch string. It has a 28 inch draw and a draw weight of 55 pounds, which is also on the low side, especially for historical bows, but we'll get to that later. The arrows we used were just standard field point arrows made of fiberglass that you could find at any sporting goods store, so we won't really be paying attention to those in this review. The first thing you notice about this bow when you pick it up is the weight. It's surprisingly light and honestly feels like if you hit something with it, it would break. Obviously this isn't quite true, of course, as you can bend this thing to string it. The string itself is relatively standard, braided with a tougher red overlay in the middle to save it from the knocking of the arrow. Looking to the handle, we see that it is bound with some sort of cloth along with a protrusion in the front to help with gripping the narrow body. There is a soft padding on the left side to protect the shaft and arrow from each other, and that's really all there is to this piece. So the next question is, how effective is this bow? Well, like everything, the answer depends on context. But to get a hint of how this is most effective, we can look to history. In the intro, I mentioned the Battle of Thermopylae, where Persian archers fired volleys of arrows in an arc into the Greek army. Let's take that apart and then see how it relates to the English longbow. Bows of one form or another have been used by humans for thousands of years, with the oldest surviving examples being found in Denmark around 11,000 years ago, and bows being invented long before that. The oldest bows in England have been dated to around 2655 BC, and they've been used by most every civilization for all recorded history. Looking at the Achaemenid Persians, those involved in Thermopylae, we see that their military strategy was centered around their archers. The front lines were made up of Sparabara shield bearers, while the meat of the army was armed with compound bows that they would fire and mass at the enemy, and this obviously was very effective given that they conquered everything from Turkey to Pakistan. Famously, however, they ran into an issue around here when for 50 years they clashed with the Greek city-states in the Greco-Persian Wars. I cover the most important battle of the war here with the Battle of Marathon. So why did the Persian archers fail? Simple, they did this. Firing an arrow in an arc, especially a steep one, gives the arrow more range, but it comes at the cost of power as much of this kinetic energy is dissipated fighting against gravity and much of the energy that propels the arrow past a certain point is just gravity. Still, these gravity arrows were quite effective against most of Persia's enemies since they didn't really have much for armor. The Greeks, however, had bronze armor and unless an arrow found an unprotected point, it would just bounce off. Fast forward about 2000 years and we're in the European Middle Ages. Bows are still around, but lo and behold, so is metal plated armor. Except now it's much, much better being made of steel and with attention to angles to glance away blows and covering almost every inch of the body. This is what the English longbow had to face. But let's rewind a bit more and focus on how bows went from this to this. The obvious differences between the accommodated style of bow and the English longbow are the size and shape. The English longbow is about six feet tall compared to the Persian style 
that was much shorter at around 3 feet. The Persian bow is also a recurve bow, which gives the bow more power at this smaller size compared to the long bow, which is one big curve over a longer length. As time went on, we saw these two styles sort of bifurcate into Asia and Europe respectively, with recurve bows existing throughout Asia and the Middle East, and straight bows being used in Europe. The major empires in Europe, mainly the Greeks and Romans, didn't use bows very much as, like we said, they generally were too weak to pierce metal armor, and the simple bows of Europe at the time were even weaker. Not to mention that both societies somewhat detested long-range weaponry and saw it as dishonorable. While the general shape of these bows was like a longbow, its length was closer to 4 or 5 feet long and thus, while good for hunting and unarmored opponents, was generally ineffective in warfare. Bows like these existed for quite a while and steadily grew in prominence. The most famous example of bows being used in early medieval combat is the Battle of Hastings in 1066 when French and Norman conquerors invaded England and defeated the Saxons forever changing the cultural and linguistic course of the island. During this battle, archers were used in a similar way as the Persians used them, with an arcing fire into the enemy. This was reasonably effective given the general lack of armor among most troops, and one such arrow even is said to have gotten King Harold in the eye, causing him immense pain and disabling him for the remainder of the battle, although not killing him. This particular example once again shows the limitations of arcing fire with archers. While effective against unarmored people and parts, these arrows lacked the killing power of more direct fire from larger bows. While the arrow that hit King Harold was incapacitating, it's very telling that the injury didn't kill him outright. Throughout the Middle Ages, longbows in England began to develop, being around 6 feet long. Draw rates are thought to have ranged considerably, and that's something we'll hit on later. These bows, however, were rather rare until the late 1200s, at which point they turned into the standard ranged weapon of English forces until the advent of gunpowder. So how were these bows used, and how effective were they? This question has been debated for quite a long time. You may have heard of the legend of how effective English longbowmen were, and answers have varied and will probably change in the future, but here's roughly what we know right now. A division of English longbowmen would likely entrench themselves on a battlefield, often near their front lines, and engage opponents at relatively close range, often within 100 to 150 yards, and usually engaging no further than 200 yards. Barricades and trenches would be employed to defend from advancing infantry and cavalry, both of which could easily dispatch archers if they got close enough. From there, arrows were generally fired directly at opponents so as to maximize power. These bows, with accompanying war arrows with thick shafts and heavy iron heads, would easily pierce chainmail and lighter armor, which was the protection that a large majority of soldiers would have. When it came to plate armor, however, there has been debate as to whether these bows could pierce it. While we can't say for sure, a recent test conducted a couple years ago, I'll link it down here with Todd's workshop, using period accurate bow, arrows, and armor, showed that in fact a steel chest plate could not be punctured by a short range shot from a longbow. This of course doesn't rule out the idea that knights could be killed by these weapons, as other parts of armor were not as thick, and of course an arrow finding a chink could be incapacitating or lethal as well. As for the construction and numbers side of the English longbow, there wasn't too much evolution, although draw weight did seem to vary. The bow itself was usually made of one piece of wood, usually yew, but also could be ash. Over the course of four years, a length of wood would be dried and slowly shaped into a D shape. String was usually made up of hemp or flax. The draw weight of these bows seems to have generally been between 100 and 185 pounds with a 30 inch draw. Some bows, however, have a lesser draw weight between, between 80 and 100 pounds. For comparison, most modern compound hunting bows have around an 80 pound draw weight and most long bows have around a 60 pound draw weight. Matt Easton on his YouTube channel actually made a good point regarding these draw weights and says that despite the stereotype of a bow being more of a woman's weapon, 
using a longbow would actually be far more tiresome than melee weapons, given the amount of strength on the arms, shoulders, and back needed to repeatedly draw such a powerful weapon. In the aforementioned video with Todd's workshop, the archer talks about what draw weights work for him, and he says that a 160 pound draw weight he can fire continuously all day, but much more than that, he quickly grows tired. So, how well does the Greyhawk compare to historical bows? Well, the bow itself is 72 inches, exactly 6 feet long, so that makes it very similar to historical dimensions. It's a draw of 28 inches, while standard for today is just a bit short of historical reality. The big difference, however, is the draw weight. At 55 pounds, the Greyhawk is much weaker than historical English longbows by one or two orders of magnitude. You can even see it in our shooting just how much the arrow seems to wobble in the air, showing it doesn't have that much velocity. While not comparable to a war bow, the Greyhawk isn't quite out of the running yet. While more powerful bows were used during war, archers were not just regular people. In fact, they were trained from a young age. As you might expect, it would be hard for a 10-year-old to draw a 160-pound bow, so they would start with less powerful bows and work their way up. So this Greyhawk could actually be very similar to a training bow of the Middle Ages, meant for juveniles. Not quite what we're looking for, I imagine, but nonetheless an interesting technicality that can make this bow historically accurate. Testing this bow was also complicated, unlike my other tests where it's relatively straightforward, just stabbing or cutting something, testing a bow is very much dependent on the skill of the archer. All of this footage is my brother, who I'd say is similar in skill to me archery-wise, maybe a little better, but neither of us are extremely good by any means and mostly we shoot in the backyard at close range around 20 yards. We went to an archery range for this and it was super fun, but we also didn't actually shoot that well. I'm sure some of you will critique the technique and everything, but just keep in mind that this is a teenager uh, shooting for shits and giggles with a gimmicky bow. Our shooting at 15 meters was decent, but things started to spread out a lot by 30 meters and past that distance we had to start arcing our shots and hitting anything past that point was just guesswork for us. Again, we had never really shot much past 20 yards and this bow was just a big step up from what we'd had before in terms of pull weight. Growing up we'd had compound bows at about 35 pounds, yeah, so this was much harder for us to get a handle on, especially given the narrowness of the shaft, which made it harder to get a good grip on the bow. Holding the bow at a draw for more than a second was difficult, but again, if you're an experienced longbow archer, this wouldn't be a problem. In terms of power, that was hard to test as well, given that it would vary strongly depending on range, and quite honestly, we'd struggle to hit it past a certain point anyway. A lot of the power of a bow depends on the type of arrows used as well, and we were just doing fiberglass arrows with the field heads. Yeah, I'm making a in short, not a lot to say on the testing point due to a massive dependence on the archer and arrows. Finally, the big question. Would I recommend this bow? My honest answer, sadly, is not really. If you were a skilled longbow archer, then the answer might be different, but for most people, this probably isn't worth it. Admittedly, it's super cool and really fun to hold, makes you feel like you're back in the Middle Ages, However, a few problems make it less fun, especially for the uninitiated. For one, the shaft is quite narrow, and it really makes it hard to get a grip on even if the material on the handle is pretty good. Second, and this is a point that only applies if you're an archery noob, as we were when we first got this, you definitely need a guard to not only cover your wrist, which is standard, but also your hand since there is no rest on the shaft and the fletching rips across your hand when you shoot the arrows. And third, probably the most annoying of the issues is that it isn't too durable. This footage was actually taken a couple years ago and when the bow wasn't in use, we've kept it unstrung and in our dehumidified basement. And yet after about a year or so, the bow has started to crack. Maybe we did something wrong or we overdrew it or something, but either way, it ended up breaking, which is too bad because it's really a cool bow, but probably not a bow you could use all the time and definitely not a bow for the uninitiated. 
Still, if you're into historical longbows and are looking for one on the cheaper side of things that you wouldn't maybe shoot that much, especially one that has a lower draw weight, then this could easily be a good pick for you. So that's it for this video guys, hope you enjoyed it. This video was a bit harder to make given that so much of how good the bow was depended on us and not the thing itself, but it was still really fun to go out and shoot this thing. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe, and hit the notification bell for more content, and I will see you in the next one, goodbye.